I was um, about seven days old when I had my first surgery. It was an emergency surgery, and uh, the doctors cut me from kidney to kidney. And it was required to save my life, and it worked, because 50 years later, I'm still here. The interesting thing, though, is the uh, scar that uh, I received uh, was about, I don't know, 15, 16 inches long. And so on an infant's body, it went from here to here. On a 50-year-old adult's body, it smoothed to like right here. <laughs> it's just kind of weird. And uh, so the scar has moved. It hasn't disappeared. And a couple of years ago, I was at a, a plastic surgeon. I had a little spot, and um, they were concerned it was cancerous. So I went, and I had my shirt off, and, and the doctor said, he said, uh, tell me about that scar there. So I told him, and he said, um, he said, what's amazing is today, if you have that same surgery, your scar would be about that big. And I said, well, isn't that great? And uh, so I just... <laughs> So I just asked him this question. I said, hey, doc, I mean, he's a plastic surgeon. I said, hey, doc, is there anything you could do about this? Because, you know, I was still young, and there was a chance for my modeling career, you know, if he could <laughs> fix that up. And, and uh, he looked up at me, and he said the most interesting response. He just looked at me, and he went, time keeps marching on. <laughs> That's all he said. And I assumed that was like a no, like there was nothing he could do. I went home, and I told my wife that story, and she said, uh, she said I guess you're stuck with that scar until you go to heaven. And what she meant by that is we believe that when, uh, that when, when uh, we're dead and gone, that we'll have a glorified body, we'll have a heavenly body, and that all of a sudden that this tent that we live in will shed this and God will give us a brand new body. That's part of the celebration of today. That's part of the resurrection. Uh, so that's kind of that's my deal. But, but here's the deal. It, it kind of brings us to an interesting conversation biblically. And uh, it's, a, it's a conversation I want to have with you in just a moment. But first, before we get there, let me just set up some Easter background for you a little bit. According to John's account, John's one of the eyewitnesses, one of the disciples of Jesus. He said this. He said, early on Easter morning, uh, Mary and some of the other women went to go see the tomb. And the reason they were going to the tomb, uh, other gospels will tell us simply this, is they were going to add uh, spices that they buried Jesus so quickly that they hadn't prepared the body appropriately, and so they were going that day. And when Mary gets there, she sees the stone has been removed from the entrance, and I love her honest response, and it's recorded here accurately. Uh, Mary's response is not, woohoo, he is risen, he is risen indeed. No. Her response is this, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where he's put him. And I love the honesty of the gospels. Why would she say such a thing? Because back then, 2,000 years ago, just like today, dead people do not come back to life. So when she went to the tomb that morning, even though Jesus predicted his death and resurrection, she did not go in anticipation and neither did the disciples. So Mary goes and she tells the disciples they've taken the body. Uh, later that day, the account tells us that Jesus actually appears to Mary. And, uh, and, and then later that evening, well, before that, the disciples, they go. They, they go to the tomb. They see the empty tomb. And then later that evening, uh, the Bible tells us what? The Bible says that the disciples are together, 10 of them. Judas had hung himself, and Thomas wasn't there. But it says, on the evening of the first day of the week, that same night, the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Again, I love the honesty of the gospel here. Here, John, the author, is saying, we were hiding. We were afraid. Even though Mary, someone that we trusted, told us she saw Jesus earlier, we were still concerned for our own lives. We were concerned that the Jewish leaders were going to come and do to us what they did to him. And so in secrecy, we were in this meeting, behind locked doors, and in walked Jesus. And then the question for us is how? How do you do that? Well, it's easy. We go, he was in his glorified body. He just walked through the wall. He walked through the door, right, which is awesome. He, he just showed up. 
And, and the Bible says when he got there, he, Jesus says to them, peace be with you. And here it is. Here's the conversation I want to have with you uh, the, this morning. He, it says, then he showed his hands and his side, hands that had been pierced with nails three days earlier, and a side that had a spear pressed inside, inside of him. And the disciples here are overjoyed when they saw the Lord. But here's the big question. We said he walked through the door because he had a glorified body. But how is it that Jesus' glorified body still had scars? Because I said that for me one day and for you one day, when we get to heaven, our body will be glorified. Jesus' body is glorified enough that he's walking through walls, but he still has scars. Why? And I don't think the Bible ever really tells us specifically why, but, but I'm going to say this. I'm going to answer it this way. I believe that every scar has a story. Think about it. I, I love when I get a chance to get to know someone. When, when, when I've been with someone long enough, I, I eventually muster up the courage, and if they have a noticeable scar, I will ask them, hey, tell me the story behind that scar. Because every scar has a story. You'll ask somebody and they'll go, oh, when I was eight years old, I was swimming in the pool and I came out and I caught my head or, or I was chasing my sister around the kitchen or, you know, I was on my bike and I was trying to do this or I was on this moped on vacation and this. Happened. Every scar has a story. My scar has a story. I don't remember that one, but I do remember another one. I, I remember when I was a little kid, around five years old or so, my dad was putting up vinyl siding. We used to call it aluminum siding, but vinyl siding on the side of the house. And he had a scaffolding, and uh, I was getting ready to, to go on the bus to go to school, and my, my parents told me to stay away from the scaffolding. And uh, with Without even knowing, I don't think my dad did this, did, did this on purpose, but the, the hammer came off the scaffolding, and it did like this, and it hit me right on the forehead. And years ago, you wouldn't see the scar, but as I get older, the scar is more noticeable. And, uh, and my friends would always ask me, they say, please, please, please tell me the hammer did, you know, that part did like this, like, in there. And it didn't work. That would have been cool if dad had to do like, like to get a, but, but he didn't. It just hit and then, and blood everywhere. And, uh, and I remember uh, just crying. I mean, blood everywhere. I'm supposed to be going on the school bus. My mother's in a panic, and they run us in the house. And she gets this towel, and I just remember the towel just filling up with blood. And, and, and in today's culture. They would have brought you to the doctors. They would put stitches in my house. My mom put a band-aid, kissed me on the forehead, and sent me to school because that's how we used to do it. That's how we used to do it. But I have the scar right here. Every scar has a story. And, and I, I believe this, that the reason why the resurrected Lord with a glorified body keeps the scars in his hands and his feet and his side because it tells an eternal story of victory. It, it tells a story. Uh, it's a forever reminder of his work at Calvary that his love triumphed over death, that his mercy is complete, that his grace is here, that when he showed his hands and his feet and his side, it was a reminder that salvation and healing and life is available through him, that he is one, that he is risen, that one day we'll be able to see him face to face. And we'll know that death had no power over him, that the grave could not hold him, that he did everything that we need for life here and life eternal. that it's done, that it's finished, that he's Lord. So during COVID, I was at work and I get a phone call and the phone call is my wife on the phone. She says, uh, your son has uh, broke his arm. And uh, growing up, um, my dad used to always say that if you broke your arm, you knew it. And uh, so I said, yeah, he probably didn't break his arm. He's probably fine. And she said, well, the bone's sticking out of his arm. <laughs> and I went, well, it sounds like he broke his arm. And so we went and we found him and we, uh, 
ran to the hospital, and that was the first of two surgeries that he had on his left, uh, his left wrist, his thrown arm. It was a couple of months later that I get a phone call from my daughter. She's a freshman in college uh, playing volleyball, and uh, the athletic director calls us, and, uh, or the personal trainer calls us and says, uh, we think your daughter has tore her ACL and her meniscus, 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 meniscus. This is why I'm a pastor, not a doctor. <laughs> and uh, she's going to require surgery. Uh, up to that point, we had done our job. Neither of our kids had ever had a broken bone, had a surgery. Our son would have two on his wrist. My daughter would have one on her knee. And for the very first time, I understood exactly what my mom and dad had meant years past when they said, if I could stand in your place, I would. And uh, I felt that. I, um, it was horrible to watch them suffer. I honestly, 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 if I could, I would have traded with them. I would have taken the pain. I would have taken the surgery. I would have taken the scar uh, so that they would be able to continue to do what they love doing. And, uh, but I couldn't. But the Bible tells us that this is exactly what God did for us in the exact same reason. That God looked down upon his creation and he saw the situation, the mess, the brokenness, the wounds, the hurt, the trauma that we were in. And because of God's great love, he said, I'm going to send my son to stand in my child's place. That he would carry our pain, our punishment, our sin that we wouldn't have to. That's the whole idea of why we come and celebrate today, that what Christ did on the cross on Good Friday, he did for us. And the fact that he rose again means that he has conquered death and the grave, that he has paid the punishment for us. That's why we're here today. But go back with me to John's account. One last, one last scar story. Thomas. The one disciple who wasn't there the night that Jesus appeared is in the upper room. And uh, before that, the disciples come to him and they say, Thomas, we've seen the risen Savior. We've seen Jesus. And he doesn't believe him. And he says to them, he says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. And understand, Thomas doesn't doubt his trusted friends here. Uh, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't doubt that they've seen something. He just isn't exactly sure. He questions the nature of their experience. Did, did, it, did, it, did they see a spirit, Jesus' a spirit, or did they see him really in a human form? And why is he doubting again? Because once again, dead people don't come back to life. The Bible says a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And again, the doors are locked. And Jesus came, and he stood among them, and again he says, peace be with you. And then he singles Thomas out, and he says, Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And then Thomas responds with one of the high points of the entire gospel. He says, my Lord and my God. This is a declaration of personal commitment. It's an understanding that the resurrection changed everything. It was proof that Jesus had predicted his death and he had rose again. It was proof that Jesus really was sent by God as God's son. It was confirmation here. It was proof that his mission, his mission of salvation was a success and that Jesus would forever be in a position of Lord and God. And then listen to how Jesus responds to Thomas. He says this. He says, because you have seen me, you believe. And of course. I mean, that's the easy part. I too would believe if I saw a person dead come back to life. I too would believe if I saw a guy walk through a wall. I too would believe if I was able to see the hands, the feet, the side. But then Jesus says these words. He says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's us. He's speaking to us. In other words, he's saying, blessed are people who believe by faith. Blessed are you and me. 
who have taken a step and said, you know, even though, though I haven't had proof, I still believe even though I haven't seen it. And some of you are here today and you say, I haven't taken that step of belief yet. Why? Because that's a faith step. It's a, it's a step believing something that, that doesn't add up. I can't put the scientific method in there. And it's been so difficult for me to believe. And Jesus' words to Thomas was what? Stop doubting and believe there's some of you here today where you know in your heart that God is real, but you haven't taken that step of faith. And I challenge you today to do so. But there's other people in the room where the reason you haven't taken a step is because you think your scars have disqualified you. See, we all have scars. Some of us have scars that are visible, but others have scars that go way deeper, inward scars, the kind of scar that nobody sees, that nobody can ask you about. And those scars are real. Oftentimes those scars are scars that we brought upon ourselves from poor decisions, personal trauma, past pains, things that we did. But sometimes those scars have something to do with something that someone's done to us. And we still carry them. And there's a part of us that thinks because of these scars we're disqualified that God would never love us, that he would never forgive us, that he would never give his grace to us. That's not true. The Bible says that God loves us and he knows the skeletons in your closet and yet he still sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for you. There's an old expression that says this. It says, time heals all wounds. Well, I got almost 51 years, and time hasn't healed this wound, this scar. It's still there. And probably time hasn't healed the wounds in your own life, those deep scars that go into your heart. So what do you do? What do you do with those scars? See, for some people, those scars define who they are. Yes, your scars tell a story, but it doesn't have to be the end of the story. Listen to this passage of Scripture. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he becomes a new creation. The new creation has come. The old has gone, and the new is here. God's desire for your life, the reason why he stood in your place, is so that you could have new life. New life, new life here, and then new life on the other side there. That you can find wholeness and healing here, and wholeness and healing there forever and ever. Now, the Bible says that there'll come a day for those who are in Christ, that you will see that we will see Jesus face to face, just like his disciples did. We'll see his hands and his feet and his side. And the Bible says that for those who are in Christ, there will be no more sadness, no more sickness, no more death, no more scars, that we will be like him, that we will be whole. That is the story of the resurrection of Christ. That's why he came. That's why he died. That's what we celebrate. And there's some of you here today, this may be the first time you're healing this, hearing this, or maybe you've been wrestling with this for a long time. Should I believe or, or has my past disqualified me? I'll say to you what Jesus said to Thomas, stop doubting and believe. And for those of you who say, I have scars, I'll say to you, blessed it is you. Blessed is you who believed even though they haven't seen. It's available to you. Today's the day. Now is your chance to make a decision that will impact your entire life. You know, from the very first day of the resurrection, people started saying it was a hoax. 2,000 years later, people still question, did it really happen? C.S. Lewis said this. He said, Christianity, the resurrection, if it's false, then it's of no importance. 
And if it's true, it's of infinite importance. Infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. Think of it this way. If the resurrection, if Christianity, if the resurrection is wrong, and you get to the end of your life, what have you lost? You've lived a good life, a moral life, a, a life of loving others, a life of upholding what is good. It's the worst that happens. But if Christianity is right, then it is the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. And it's the only decision that truly matters in the end because all of us will stand before God one day. And you can't say nobody ever told you because the day you've heard it, there is a God who loves you, who loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die upon the cross so he, like any good parent could, takes your pain, your suffering. And he did it because he wanted to bring wholeness and healing to you. And then he rose again on that Easter morning, that Resurrection Sunday, to show that what he said, who he is, was absolutely 100% true. It was real. That we would have eternal life with him. And the Bible says that one day we too will rise with him just as he has risen. That's what we're here for today. That if you're here and you've never taken that step of faith, if you've allowed the scars of your past to handcuff you from, from receiving everything that Jesus would have for you, I would, I would encourage you today to stop fighting, stop doubting, stop selling yourself short, and receive the grace of Jesus. Would you take a moment just all around this place and just bow your heads and close your eyes? If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I'd like to begin that faith journey. I'd like to take a step in being what it is to be a follower of Christ, the follower of Jesus. I'm open to learning what it means to follow after him. If that's you in a moment, I wanna, I wanna pray for you. with our heads bowed and our eyes closed and in a time of just reverence before the Lord. If you're here and you say, Brian, I, I'd love for you to pray for me. I want to take that step towards God. If that's you, would you just raise your hand real quick? Just raise up already. I just see hands already. Other folks say, that's me. Thank you. Other folks, that's me. Yeah, all over this place. Then I'm going to pray a prayer. And when I do, I'm going to ask you, in all sincerity and honesty before the Lord, you just pray your heart out. Heavenly Father, this morning we acknowledge that we have scars. We acknowledge, God, that we have doubts. We acknowledge that there's times where we have just decided to do our own thing and not follow you. And today, we want that to change. We recognize, God, that our ways haven't worked, that, that our ways haven't healed. And today we declare that you are the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Today we ask you to forgive us of our sins. We ask you to pour your grace and your mercy upon us. We pray, God, that you would give us a new life, that we would have that great hope that blessed hope that one day we would spend eternity with you and it's our desire to find out what it means to follow after you. That we would have that wholeness and healing that only you could provide. In Christ's name we pray.